I want to propose something to you all today. Uh, I want to propose that you resolve something very powerful to love who you are right now. And of course, I think that wanting to be your best self and setting goals and intentions is really major. Take a moment to look at what is really running through your mind about yourself that may be holding you back. The energy of the universe responds to positivity. And so if you're telling yourself you're not slim enough, you're not good enough, when that negative chatter starts in your head, stops, lean away from it. When you let those thoughts of not being enough seep in, you can't really act out the best of yourself. So your actions must be in alignment with all the goodness and strength that you know to be true about yourself. Life is like a wave and you ride it through the ups and downs, the steady times, and then you anchor yourself in the storms. A mistake is a life experience designed to move you in a different direction. And a mistake might be more important to your supreme destiny than even a triumph. Know that your life is way bigger than any one experience. So when those mistakes happen, you use them to guide you to the next right move. What mistake or mistakes have you made in your life that you need to, number one, forgive yourself for? And what mistakes turned out to be blessings in disguise? It's all about progress, not about perfection, because nobody's perfect. It's about progress. I believe that when you're fully present, that's when you're actually fully alive. You're clearer, you're more calm, you're not distracted and able to experience all the nuance and wonder of a life more awakened. So when we can just tune into what's just in front of us, life becomes simpler and less crowded with the to do's, the what ifs and the why nots. And when you need to focus on what to do or what to do next, the focus is just that. So deeper human connection comes from that way of operating in the world. And the now becomes your everything. Now, this is what I know, that it's one of the most impactful spiritual practices, knowing the power of now. Because the only moment we all have, you have, I have, is now. Past, already gone. The future, not even your next breath, guaranteed. Letting go of energy that's clouding your vision and holding you back. It's a life practice that I learned long ago that has freed me whew, so many ways. It's a fact that holding grudges against somebody who's done you wrong or replaying, revisiting hurtful situations in your head over and over only weighs you down and prevents you from being who you're meant to be right now because you're still energetically holding on to the past. The energy that you put into constantly rewinding to the resentment, why did they do that? Why did they say that to me? I didn't deserve to be treated that way. All of that only keeps you stuck. It will never change what happened. You gotta press stop and reject the urge to keep replaying so that you can then fast forward into the now for yourself. You know, a lot of people think that holding on to things that disempowered them is gonna somehow magically turn it around. Mm -mm. You have to release the notion, give up the hope that the past could have been any different. And you also must release the idea that people would do what you might do in any given instance. This is a big one. I had to learn and relearn before I actually got it. Expecting people to do what you would do in a situation only leads to your disappointment. Not theirs, they're going on with their life. So let people be who they are and either you accept it or you don't. Not doing that keeps you stuck in a circumstance that actually costs you time, cost you energy. And I can guarantee that oftentimes the person on the other side of the bitterness you're holding on to, they're not even thinking about you. In fact, they probably have just moved on. They certainly aren't obsessing the way you are. Think of it like letting go of any bad habit that just doesn't serve your well-being. Not an easy task. Taking the road to a more enlightened, healthy existence never is. So this is what I want to ask you to ask yourself. Why? Am I holding on to this? How is this serving me? And really think about the answer. Maybe it makes you feel validated. Maybe it makes you feel righteous 
or maybe taking on the pain is your way of recognizing the injustice so that even though it won't be made right, it can at least not be forgotten. It's very difficult for me to even see myself as successful because I still see myself as in the process of becoming successful. To me, successful is getting to the point where you are absolutely comfortable with yourself and it does not matter how many things you have acquired. Uh, the ability to learn to say no and not to feel guilty about it, to me, is about the greatest success I have achieved. It's the same thing that prevents you from being abused as a child, that prevents you from being abused as an adult, that allows you to build success for yourself. I will not be treated this way. I demand only the best for myself. You are worthy to say no. You are worthy that it's okay if you say no. It's okay if you say no and then people don't like you. That's really okay. The important thing is how you feel about what you're doing, how you feel about yourself. It's a long struggle though. It's a long struggle. And I'm just hoping that, you know, in the work that I do on the show and the speaking that I do around the country and that young people who are watching this can get the lesson sooner than I did. Because it's painful, because you keep repeating it over and over and over until you get it right. And what I found is that every time you have to repeat the lesson, it gets worse because it's, you know, it's, I, I call it God trying to get your attention, the universe trying to get your attention. So we didn't get your attention the first time, so we're going to have to hit you a little harder this time. So I'm still doing it. I'm still learning. Turn your wounds into wisdom. You will be wounded many times in your life. You'll make mistakes. Some people will call them failures. But I have learned that failure is really God's way of saying, excuse me, you're moving in the wrong direction. What is the truest highest vision that you hold for yourself. No matter where you are in your life, there's always the next level. There's always the next level to the last breath. So I feel that I always knew that I would get be done with the show when I felt like, oh, I've said as much as I could say here on this Thanks. platform. So I feel that until you have used your value as a human being, you're not done. I teach them that there is no life without cultivating a spiritual life because you are first and foremost a spiritual being having a human experience. And if you lose sight of that, it's easy to get lost in the world and no one can save a world that they're lost in when they've lost sight of their own North Star. So having a spiritual life actually means actively and ritually creating the space in your life all the time for gratitude, for kindness, for empathy, for inspiration, for joy, and for reverence for life in the home of your soul first. And then working to spread that inner joy outward. It means slowing down. It means taking in the moment. It means being exactly where you are, not distracted somewhere else. It means knowing who you are and getting about the business of fulfilling why you really came to our planet. It is your job to make yourself whole. Not perfect, but whole and full. Your real work in life, your real work, is to fill yourself till your cup runneth over so that you're never grasping and needy, clamoring and insecure. When you're saying, I know who I am, and, and I'm telling you, it's the thread that runs through everything. It's the thing that allows you to stand in your own truth. And one of the things for years that Maya Angelou used to say to me is, baby, you need to know that you alone are enough. You alone are enough. What I know for sure is that in this world, time is a moving on and it's our most valuable commodity. You can never get it back. So staying in that loop, playing it over and over in your head of hurt only amplifies your pain. Let it go. Exhale, make room in your heart for something that is uplifting. Surround yourself with people who want the best for you. You have the ability to shift the DNA of your spirit and control how you perceive life. So why not lighten your load and let it go? Living integrity means living in a way that honors your truest self. It's doing the thing that you know you're supposed to do. 
My friend Martha Beck says that deep down, we all know what makes us happy and how to create your best possible life. And that knowledge is actually coded into your very nature. But I also know how challenging it can be to listen and trust your own inner voice, especially when you feel the pressures of what everybody else thinks you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to get married. You're supposed to stay married. You're supposed to have a baby. You're supposed to have a picture perfect home. But here's something that I'm hoping you all will realize for yourself. Sometimes it takes doing the things that people or society say you're not supposed to be doing to find out what is true for you. What is What are you really supposed to be doing? For example, at the very beginning of my career, some of you have heard this story, I worked as a news anchor and reporter in Baltimore, it taught me a lot about life. And during that time, I, I knew I wasn't being my authentic self. I didn't like doing the news. I, I just didn't like it. But the voice of my father, who thought he knew what I was supposed to do, and even my own voice saying, wow, this is an important job. My father was saying, don't you give up that job, girl. You're making $25,000. You're never going to make that in one year. So eventually, my bosses let their feelings be known. They took me off the news and put me on this local talk show called People Are Talking. And when that decision was made at first, I thought it was a demotion. But after one day on that talk show, I felt so energized and so fueled, I knew that I had come home to myself. And that's what living integrity, even in your work, feels like. So trust me when I say that only you know what that feels like for you. And with that in mind, I want us to be more in alignment with the truth for ourselves this week, who you're meant to be, who you are right now. What have you been waiting and wanting to do? All those insights should fuel your decisions about how you move through the world right now. Pay attention to what makes you feel lit up from the inside. Examine any moments when your, 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 your head's saying one thing and your spirit is saying another. And everybody has a different talent. And the reason we're all so messed up is because you're looking at everybody else's yeah. talent yeah. and wishing you had some of their talent. All the energy that you spend thinking about, wishing about, being jealous of, envious of anybody else is energy that you're not only putting out, it's gonna come back to you negatively, but you're taking that away from you. All your energy should be forced on, what do I have to offer? What do I have to give? How can I be used in service? Because Dr. King's message of not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. And there is not a job in here that you can do that you don't switch the paradigm to service and not make that job more fulfilling. I don't care what the job is. If you say, if I look at this from, how do I use this in service to something bigger than myself? It no longer becomes a job. It becomes an offering to the world. There is not one thing that has ever happened to you. Not one experience, not one encounter, not one crisis, not one joyful thing that hasn't happened just to make you better and help you rise. Every single thing you're calling in, whether you know it or not, when you figure out that you are calling it in, when you actually start meditating or praying or doing or having a spiritual practice, which is the number one thing you need if you want to be successful in the world. You need something that gives back and nourishes you, regardless of what you call that. You need to, you need to fill your cup so that you can be so full, your cup runneth over and you have enough to give to other people. If you don't fill your cup, you end up dried up. You end up tired, exhausted, and don't have enough to give to other people. You end up resentful every time somebody asks you because your cup is empty and now they want some of yours. <laughs> so your number one job, your number one job is to fill your cup and make yourself whole. That's your job. And I am now at this stage of my career thinking about how to do that more poignantly and fruitfully. I'm now looking for ways that I can do that to uh, create a level of sustainability in within our communities that will go long beyond you know, my lifetime. 
everything you even try to do to me is already done to mm. you. That is not just a, a rhetorical saying, that is law. That is Newton's third law of motion in physics, which says everything that goes out is coming back. Mm. It's just like everything that goes up is coming down, may take it a long time to come down, is coming down. <laughs> everything that goes out is coming back, it's coming back. So. To answer the power of manifestation and meditation, what meditation does is sync you up with the source. What meditation does is allows you to literally tap into the power that created you so that you are in alignment with that. And so when you carry that out into the world, everything that you do comes from the center of that alignment that's coming from the source that we call God, we call divine energy, divine intelligence, whatever name you want to give it to, we call life. When you are synced up with life, life just gives to you. Wherever you are in your life, in your relationships, every person that you encounter, every experience, the person wants to know, was that okay? Was that okay? And what I started to hear was that what people are really saying is, did you hear me? Did you hear me? And did what I say mean anything right. to you? And so I started to listen with that in mind, with that intention of validating that your being here, your speaking to me, your taking the time to do this with me is important because you matter. And that's true for everybody who's watching or listening, that every argument that you ever have, every encounter, the person just wants to know, did you hear me? Did you see me? And did I say anything that mattered? You, you will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal. There really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful, expression of yourself as a human being. You want to max out your humanity by using your energy to lift yourself up, your family, and the people around you. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Do you believe that you are worthy of happiness? Do you believe that happiness, success, abundance, comfort, fulfillment, peace, joy, love is a part of your birthright? Is that what you believe? Or do you believe something else? Because you will manifest the life that you believe. I've always known that no matter what my belief is, I'm going to be all right. Empowerment is authority. It is a sign permission slip to actually seize the day. It's the process of getting stronger and more confident and more engaged. And to be empowered is to move through the world without any kind of fear or any kind of apology. And with these gifts comes an even deeper privilege, I believe, and that is the ability to take charge of your own life, to own yourself and claim your rights. And here's what I know for sure, that to whom much is given, much is expected. And I have been given so much. I've earned it. I've been blessed with it, but I've been given a lot. And that's why I've chosen to use my life to lift other people up. Nobody's journey is seamless or smooth. We all stumble, we all have setbacks. If things go wrong, you hit a dead end, as you will. It's just life's way of saying, time to change course. So ask every failure, this is what I do. Every failure, every crisis, every difficult time, I say, what is this here to teach me? And as soon as you get the lesson, you get to move on. If you really get the lesson, you pass and you don't have to repeat the class. If you don't get the lesson, it shows up wearing another pair of pants or skirt to give you some remedial work. And what I found is that difficulties come when you don't pay attention to life's whisper because life always whispers to you first. first. And if you ignore the whisper sooner or later, you'll get a scream. Whatever you resist persists, 
But if you ask the right question, not why is this happening, but what is this here to teach me? What is this here to teach me? It puts you in the place and space to get the lesson you need. I have always known this about celebrity. The real power of being somebody that somebody knows, and I really think that the only difference between being famous and not is that more people know your name. So the only difference between understanding that is understanding that what Selma has done, what Susan has done, what Anna has done, Rebecca has done, what Jim has done, what I've done, you too can do. Because true philanthropy comes from living from the heart of yourself and giving what you have been given. How will you do that? How will you use your personality, the energy of your personality, to serve that which is your soul's calling? I know this for sure. Any life, no matter how fantastic it is, how glorious it seems, how much attention you receive, how much square footage you have, any life and every life is enhanced by the sharing and the giving and the opening up of the heart space. Your life gets better when you can find a way to share it with someone else. So what we've done, you can do. The real empowerment comes when every person leaves this room and makes a decision, makes a decision. Maybe that decision is that you will write a check and support some of the wonderful organizations you've heard here today. But the true decision is, how will you use yourself? How will you use everything that you have been given to serve that which is greater than yourself? How will you use that to become truly, authentically empowered? Now, it is a beautiful thing to receive an award and to be on the cover of Variety. Thank you very much. It's a beautiful thing. But the true reward is in the lives that you are able to touch and the people who you know you have impacted. I live and move and have my being. And you want to know why I am really so successful? I knew that at four years old. I knew that when my grandmother said, you better watch me now, because one day you're going to have to learn how to wash these clothes and hang them up like this. So I'd watch how I hold these clothes pins in my mouth. I went, mm. <laughs> And the reason I could do that is because spirit, otherwise known as intuition, my instinct said, mm -mm, that's not going to be my life. So we all have that spiritual side. And this lesson tonight is about connecting to it. I believe that beneath the surface of all physical problems is a spiritual solution. There is a spiritual solution. Why? Because you are a spiritual being having a human experience. That's the beginning of understanding spirituality. You are a spiritual being having a human experience. And I would say reading is the strongest signal for success in the future that I've ever seen. It is the strongest, strongest, strongest. I got my first job in radio uh, when I was 16 years old, because I've been, been broadcasting since I was 16 years old. But my first job I got because I was a great reader. When you are a great reader, you can articulate and speak and command the English language in ways that other people cannot. And people think you're a lot smarter than you are, <laughs> lots of times, because you're a great reader. If somebody ever says to you, if you're ever rejected in that way, you never, ever, ever forget it. I said, but it's okay. I did okay, you did okay. It's all, right. it's all right. But the answer to your question is, if you can find what is your passion, if you find what you love, you never get tired. Or if you do get tired, it, you, you're fueled by the energy of your work. So I believe that, um, that what has happened to me is really the beginning of the greater passion to come. But if you find out what you're supposed to do, and you know what you're supposed to do by how it, how it feels. You know, people wait on the voice of God to be some, the Moses in the burning bush. I think that was only Bible talk, you know, because he doesn't come to burning bushes for people. He comes through your heart. He speaks through your heart, through your feelings. And so you know what, if you're doing the right thing, if it feels like it's right to you. And when you hit the thing that feels right, when you know 
it's the right thing. You would, you know it's right because it gives you your juice and you know it's right because you would do it for nothing. You would do it for nothing and find a way to be able just to do it in order to be able to continue. That's how you know you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. From time to time, you may stumble, fall. You will for sure count on this. No doubt. You will have questions and you will have doubts about your path. But I know this, if you're willing to listen, to be guided by that still small voice that is the GPS within yourself, to find out what makes you come alive, you will be more than okay. You will be happy, you will be successful, and you will make a difference in the world. Many times you will have angst and worry about things and put yourself in a state, like someone said this morning because their phone went off, they were mortified over a phone, I said, really? Um, you will put yourself in a state when the other person really isn't even thinking about you. So. Learning that I could specifically determine for myself what the boundaries were for me, what I wanted to do, give my money, give my time, give of my service to who I wanted to give it to when I did, that I get to make that decision. And just because you get a hundred requests a week doesn't mean you have to try to fulfill all of that. Just because you have all of these demands on your time and on you doesn't mean that you have to say yes. You get to decide because you're the master of your fate. The captain of your soul, as William Ernest Henley said in Invictus. And understanding that really changed the meaning of my life in that I was not no longer driven by what other people wanted me to do, but took charge of my own destiny, making choices based upon what do I feel is the next right move for me. Create a baseline for ourselves that's based on intention. This was around 1989 when I'd read Gary Zukav's book called The Seat of the Soul. And that book was life changing for me because in it he talked about the power of intention and that cause and effect, what goes out comes back, is determined by your intention. The energy of your intention is what determines your life. Most people don't think about their intention. They just think about what they want to do. Most people don't think about why they want to do it. But what's going to come back to you, the energy that's going to come back to you, is the real why of why you did it. I was hired in television, not knowing anything about it, having in mind Barbara Walters, but thinking, oh, okay, I can do that. Uh, not knowing how to write or film or anything. And I think it was because it was the... It was the times, and I literally had somebody who was willing to work with me that I, that I managed to find my way. But I had to find my way right. because the reporting never really fit me. And mm. what did work for me, I'm this old, I'm so old that when I started that um, it was a year of live action cam. And so it was like video cameras live. And so the news stations would do a live, a live shot. They would throw to somebody live even if nothing was going on. And what I found is wasn't so good at the writing part, but if I was just standing up and talking about what had just happened, it was really good. And then I started to feel, so I started in 19, working in television, became an anchor immediately afterwards. I could feel inside myself that reporting was not the right thing for me, even though I was happy to have the job. I got an offer to go to Atlanta. I was making $10,000 a year in 1971, but still in college, so I was thinking I was doing pretty good. I got an offer to go to Atlanta for 40,000, which I thought, it's over. I'm gonna make $40,000. And my boss at the time said to me, you do not know what you don't know, and you need to stay here until you can learn to write better, until you can perfect your craft as, as a journalist. And so I, I, he said, and we can't give you 40, but we can give you 12. So to make a long story short, because I'd be here all day just talking about how it all came about, I started listening to what 
felt like the truth for me. This is, I started to feel that porting wasn't for me, but I had my father, I had my friends, everybody was saying, oh my God, you're, you're an anchor woman, you're on TV, I mean, you can't give up that job. And when I was, by the time I was making 25, my father goes, well, you just hit the jackpot, you're not gonna make no more money than that, that's just it. <laughs> So I was torn between what the world was saying to me and what I felt to be the truth for myself. It felt like an unnatural act for me reporting, although I knew that to a lot of people it was glamorous. And I started to just inside myself think, what, what, what do I really want to do, what I really want to do? And I will say this, knowing what you don't want to do is the best possible place to be if you don't know what to do because knowing what you don't want to do leads you to figure out what is it you, you really do want to do. When I was a news reporter, it was so unnatural for me, I, you know, to cover somebody's tragedies and difficulties and then to not to have feel anything for it. If I were to put it in business terms it, it, or, or to leave you with the message, that the truth is I have from the very beginning listened to my instinct. All of my best decisions in life have come because I was attuned to what really felt like the next right move for me. So when I got the call to come to Chicago, after, you know, starting uh, with, a, with a co-anchor and, and working an, in talk for several years, I knew that it was the right thing to do. Every single person, except my best friend Gail, said you're going to fail. Every single person when I left, they, my bosses by this time thought I was terrific and said, you're going to, you're, you're, you're walking into a landmine, you're going to fail, you're going to fail, Chicago's a racist city, you're black, you're not going to make it. everything to, to keep me staying. They then offered me a car and an apartment and all this stuff. And I said, no, if I fail, then I will find out what is the next thing for me. And I was not one of those people, you know, all of my... Um, the people who worked with me in news, they would have their tapes and they'd have their stories and they'd have, you know, uh, resumes ready. I didn't have any of that because I knew that the time would come mm -hmm. where I would, where what I needed would show up for me. And when that showed up, I was ready because my definition of luck is preparation meeting the moment of opportunity. And I was pre prepared to be able to step into that, that world of talk in a way that I, I knew I could do it. I changed how I viewed power about uh, 1989. There was a book I read by uh, a man named Gary Zukov called Seed of the Soul. And in Seed of the Soul, he defined what is true power, what is authentic power. And, and his definition of authentic power meaning the kind of power that can never be taken from you. Not your looks, not your fame, not your money, not your square footage, but authentic power is when the personality, your personality, comes to serve the energy of your soul. When you are able to align who you are, who you've become in the world, with really what you've come to do in the world, when your personality serves the soul. So I thought a lot about that. That book was actually life-changing for me. And I was building a home in Santa Barbara. And as anybody who's ever built a bathroom or a home or anything, nothing ever happens on time. And it was 2002 and we we're supposed to be finished and it wasn't finished. And I was like, I can't wait to get in my house and I'm finally gonna have a great Christmas and I'm gonna do the kind of Christmas that I dreamed of from the Courier and Ives, you know, cards. So I'm gonna have the reeds on the door, and, but I didn't have a floor, so it's a little difficult to do that. So I started to think if I can't do that Christmas. Well, what, what am I going to do for Christmas? My house isn't even ready, and what can I do? So I started as I was walking around through the trees, sitting under that tree, because my favorite time is to be alone with my thoughts. And as I was alone with my thoughts, I was thinking, what would be the next best possible Christmas for myself? And I thought of the best Christmas I ever had. The best Christmas I ever had was when I was 12 years old. My mother was on welfare. 
I was living with my mother and a half brother and sister in Milwaukee. And my mother called me, the oldest, to say, into a room to say, we won't be having Christmas this year. I said, we won't be having Christmas. What about Santa Claus? There is no Santa Claus. I had already figured that out, but okay. I was embarrassed and I was ashamed because for the first time I had to face the reality that, yeah, what I've been suspecting, that we're not like the other kids, that we really are poor, is true. So we're not going to have Christmas and there is no Santa Claus. My first thought after being embarrassed and ashamed was what will my story be? What am I going to tell everybody? when we go back to school and they're showing their toys and I don't have anything to talk about. What am I gonna do? I'm not gonna go outside tomorrow when everybody's out in the yards, in their yards, showing the toys they got for Christmas. I'm gonna stay inside. Am I gonna pretend I'm sick? What, am, what is my story going to be? Well, late that night, some nuns showed up at our house and they brought a basket of um, food and they brought toys for my, uh, my brother and my sister. And I was overwhelmed with joy that those nuns showed up. Not because they brought me a Tammy doll when I really wanted a Barbie doll. I was overwhelmed because somebody remembered that we existed and somebody cared enough in the middle of the night to come to our house with food and toys. And also I would now have a story. So as I was contemplating, what is the, that was the best Christmas I ever had. I thought, how could I make that possible for somebody else? What could I do to create the same kind of experience for other children? So I took 50 members of my team at Harpo and hired another 50 people in South Africa. And we went to South Africa with the idea of creating something that we ended up doing a documentary about called Christmas Kindness. Christmas Kindness using my personality to serve the energy of my soul. So we went from village to village offering toys and clothes, food, soccer, boy, soccer balls to children who'd never experienced Christmas before. And early in the morning, you could see them lining up by the thousands to come. And we actually went to 10 or 12 villages to do this. And people said to me at the time, oh, that's so frivolous, and the kids won't remember it, and why don't you use your money to do something else, more substantial, Oprah? And I said, they may not remember the toy. They may not remember the clothes, although they were most excited, the children, to open boxes uh, containing clothes because, um, as their caretaker said to us, having new clothes made them not feel poor. And for so many of these kids, it was the first time they'd ever experienced having something that was new for them. They may not remember what they got in the box, but they will remember that somebody remembered them. They will remember the experience. I know you all have heard the phrase, everybody makes mistakes countless times in your life, and maybe even said it to console someone and encourage them to not dwell on a misstep. So I'm asking today, why do we let our mistakes overshadow our good decisions and accomplishments? What I know for sure is that mistakes are here to help define us. And when I started the Oprah Winfrey Network, whew, I definitely made some mistakes, some missteps. We launched before we were ready. And I gotta tell you all, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done a lot of things differently. I remember saying at the time, that if I was to write a book about it, I would call it Mistakes 101. Sometimes when you aren't listening to those inner voices and the knowing of your own purpose, you can get off track. And even when I know how to listen, sometimes if I don't listen, whoa, I get off track really quickly. You can get in the wrong relationships or you can do things prematurely, get yourself off track. Well, this is what I know. Every perceived mistake can be an opportunity to know better and do better. And from that perspective, there really is no such thing as failure. We may perceive it that way in the moment, but things always turn around and eventually lead you to the path that you're supposed to be on if you're paying attention. What are you here to do? What are you here to fulfill? What are you here to offer? Maybe it's friendship, companionship, leadership. Maybe you're all the ships, including the mothership that's always steering things forward 
for the rest of the people in your life? Well, I want you to know this for sure. Life is like a wave and you ride it through the ups and downs, the steady times, and then you anchor yourself in the storms. A mistake is a life experience designed to move you in a different direction. And a mistake might be more important to your supreme destiny than even a triumph. Know that your life is way bigger than any one experience. So when those mistakes happen, you use them to guide you to the next right move. Learn from it. Ask, what is this here to teach me? And then let it go. Because you're always where you need to be. My favorite quote from Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth has gotten me through many a mistake and many a storm. It says, life will give you whatever experience is most helpful for the evolution of your consciousness. And how do you know this is the experience you need? Because this is the experience you are having at this moment. That knowing has helped me through many a moment. I never knew what a brand was when I, start, when, I, when I first started out. I didn't even know what that was. I became a brand by making every decision flow from the truth of myself. Every choice I made uh, for every show that was going to be on the air, I made based upon, does this feel right? Does this feel right? Does this feel right? Um, is this going to help somebody? Is this going to help somebody? That's not going to help somebody. And I learned my, my, my biggest teachers were, were, were people like the Ku Klux Klan and skinheads because I was sitting on television one day doing an interview with the KKK. And I realized in that moment that the energy that I was broadcasting throughout the world was energy that I did not uh, want to be a part of. And so I literally, in, in the middle of a commercial break, I just thought, I will never do this again. I will only allow my platform to be used for, uh, as a force for good. And that there are many forms of the KKK, even if it's not called that. So I really made a conscious decision to use myself and to use the platform for that which I thought was going to enhance, uh, enlighten people in a way. So that's the difference. In that moment, I stopped being used by television and made a decision to use television. Does this happen to y'all? The older you get, you find it hard to believe the number you are because you still feel like you've always felt. At the end of this week, I'm turning 68. It's, I can't even fathom that number because when I was much younger, 68 felt not just old, it felt ancient. And now, this is what I know, it's just a marker how many trips you've been around the sun because we get to determine what that number means for each of us. A good friend asked me recently, did I consider myself retired? And I say, mm -mm, no, I don't. Not a word in my vocabulary. Although I no longer do the show that was a mainstay of my career, I refocus my energy elsewhere and I'm always staying open to new possibilities and opportunities. So I'm never close to new ideas, producing new television dramas for own, traveling. So for me, as I approach yet another turn around the sun, I truly believe that many more delights are ahead and I hope that you all feel the same. Barring major health setbacks, age is whatever number you choose to feel. Gail says she feels 45. I don't even have a number because I just feel like now the present moment, because that's all we ever have. The past is gone, the future's not promised to anybody, and when the future does show up, it's still gonna be the now. So I live for, I celebrate, and consistently remind myself to stay in this moment, doing whatever this moment requires, giving it my full attention. And in this moment, I feel connected to the source of all things. I feel wise and peaceful and content. And yet, this moment allows me to see it's never too late to reach a new height that you never thought possible or achieve a new goal. It can be as small as picking up a new hobby to add a little more joy in your day, as radical as moving across the country to pursue the life you've always wanted. Whatever you've dared to desire, I encourage you to pursue it in the hopes of starting a next chapter that is bigger and fuller than anything you've lived thus far. So just keep growing and becoming more of yourself. That's the goal. Through relationships, through challenges, through victories and setbacks, big and small, to recognize that 
you aren't just living out your days, you are life expressing itself through your physical body, your personality, your emotions, and it's never too late to take the reins in the famous lines of Invictus, you are the master of your fate, you are the captain of your soul. You know, Maya Angelou said to me years ago when I'd come back from doing my school in South Africa, the opening of the school, and I was, she, she wasn't able to attend, so I came directly from South Africa to Maya's house, Jay, and I was sitting at the kitchen table and she was teaching me how to make biscuits, and I said, oh, Maya, the school's going to be so, that school's going to be my legacy, it's going to be incredible, and she said, you have no idea what your legacy is going to be, because your legacy is every life you touch. Your legacy isn't one thing. Your legacy is everybody who was moved to, who watched your show, who went back to school, who got out of a domestic violent relationship, who changed the way they saw things. What I, what I realize is that if you come into success and fame, and particularly fame, because fame is its own world and definition, because it really is based upon what other people think of you. So, because fame isn't what you think of yourself, it's what other people think of you. Um, when, if you come into that and you don't have a grounded, centered self, you will be controlled by the outside instead of the inside. And if you come into that, not in the fullness of knowing who you are and what you're supposed to do with that fame, whenever somebody likes you or doesn't like you, that determines whether or not you're having a good day or a bad day. And you, are, you have lost control of your, your own life. So I think what fame teaches you quickly is to grow the wholeness within yourself so that you're not controlled by others outside opinions of you. Each of us comes into the world with our own worldview. And that worldview is actually shaped from the crib. And you get from the world what you project into the world and you project into the world what you were raised with and what you were raised around. So that's why what happened to you is the essential question. I want people to understand, most importantly, that when you are arguing with a friend and they act like they can't hear you because they're arguing so strongly back at you, they really can't because of the way the brain is structured. So when you're in fear mode, anxiety mode, when you're really amped up, you just need to, both of you need to calm down, take a walk, take a break and come back. Well, you start with understanding that your cup being full is how you allow yourself to give to other people. You, you can't give what you don't have. You can't love if you haven't been loved. You don't even know how to begin to do that. So I think it begins with fundamentally understanding that you are worthy enough, you are valuable enough, you matter enough to give yourself the love that you deserve. And that starts by taking out time for yourself. So I have my own rhythm and pattern. I know that if I go six days and then on the seventh, by the seventh or eighth, don't give myself a break, that lots of other things give, that I'm not as alert, I'm not as attuned, I'm not as centered, I'm not as focused. So I know that that is, that is my limit. I cannot go beyond a certain amount of days. And for me, um, walking in nature uh, is my solace. It is where I feel that I am one with all and all being, you know, all creation and, you know, connected. For other people, it may be dancing, it may be music, it may be knitting, it may be whatever it is that brings some kind of rhythmic pattern into your life. Actually, it was Bruce and I were walking on my campus in South Africa and uh, there were a group of girls dancing, literally on the lawn, because Lord knows they love to dance. And Bruce says, oh, that's not just, I said, oh, they're just having fun. And Bruce said, oh, they're not just having fun, they actually are healing themselves. Mm -hmm. Because the rhythmic pattern, that's why when you've been in an argument with someone, or you're in the middle of an argument with somebody, if you just go and take a walk, or you go and turn on some music and you start dancing. If you just have some form of movement, you feel better. 
One of the most important things, most, most important takeaways from what happened to you, I believe, is understanding how the brain works. You understand that when you're upset or in fear or angry or are in, in an antagonized state, and you're trying to reason with a person, a child, your spouse, your boss, your friend, they literally cannot hear you because the reasoning part of the brain is in the cortex and what you're saying is only reaching the brain stem. So whenever somebody is dysregulated, which is what that is, being ang anxious and fearful and yelling and screaming, the thing to do is to calm yourself first then you will be able to help that other person get calm and regulated. That's how you get to reason. But if you both are just yelling at each other, literally, and you're going, you don't hear me, and you don't hear me either, and you don't hear, they actually cannot hear you. That's what I thought was so fascinating. One of the most important things I have learned with coping is to accept this moment for what it is. Do not spend your energy pushing, and, and that's whether you are late in traffic or whether you are late on your bills and you don't know where the next uh, uh, paycheck is coming from to do it. Don't spend your energy resisting what is. You know, the five stages of grief begin with shock and denial and end with acceptance. I have found that to be a great formula for operating in any crisis or challenging circumstance. Get to acceptance as quickly as you can, and that will allow you to cope better with this present moment. Because when you are pushing against, I wish it wasn't this way. I mean, I've seen so many people during this pandemic, last March, can't, I can't wait until this is over. That was last March, now we're a year later. And they've spent the year in resistance instead of, ah, this is where we are. Not so sure when we're gonna get to shore. I just better learn how to tread stronger. Oh, my legs are getting stronger in the tread. So being able to accept the treading moment for what it is and, and having the wisdom, the faith, the understanding, the knowing that you're not gonna be in this moment forever. Because if life does anything, it consistently, consistently changes. So for however long we're in this pandemic moment, it is not going to be forever, but how do I make the adjustment to accept the moment for what it is and stop pushing against it, using all of my energy, wanting it to be something that it's not. It's that whole adage of accepting the things you can change and being willing to live with the things you cannot. So that has been the most helpful for me. I don't have a problem coping because I immediately go to, this is what it is. Now what must I do to be fully present in this moment, not resisting and pushing against it? I thought trauma had to be a big, gigantic thing, experience. You had to go through a tsunami, literally, a, if not literally a tsunami, a tsunami-like crisis in your life. A fire, a hurricane, a tragedy, a car accident, a stabbing, a, somebody died. And it was through co-authoring this book with him that I understood that it was the consistent little things. It was the aggressions and microaggressions in a person's life that causes them to have their own worldview. Whatever that worldview is for you is different from me. So the biggest, the biggest learning for me is that trauma doesn't have to have a great big old capital T on it. It's really how you were loved and that neglect and trauma are hand in hand because both are equally as toxic. I, over the years of interviewing people, it was my greatest classroom. I was always paying attention to what people were saying and paying attention to their lives. And what I understood and could articulate, not through science, but just through my own observation is that, oh, people are as dysfunctional, as unhappy, as disoriented in their lives based on how far they are from the center of themselves. And the center is where wholeness lies, as you know. And so where there is no 
where there is no center and there is no sense of wholeness and love for yourself, there's going to be a disarray, chaos, confusion, and, you know, dysfunction in your life. And I saw that over and over and over again, that people behave based on how they were loved and then how they were able to process that in, that, that in a way to love other people. One of, the, one of the most important points I think Dr. Perry makes in What Happened to You is that neglect is as toxic as trauma. And so even though you might not have had a trauma with a big T, mm. that the, it boils down to, did you get what you needed? And I have done so many interviews, as I know you have too, Jay, with people who are raised in the same family and everybody in that family has a different experience. And sometimes siblings are arguing about a thing that happened because from their point of view, it felt like one thing. And from the other person's point of view, it felt like another thing. Well, that is the reality of life, that you can have two children, four children, six children raised in the same household, and they experience the love of their parents differently. And not all the kids could have gotten what they needed, and some of the kids got what they needed. So neglect is you not getting what you needed for your worldview, for your personal um approach to life, your sense of self values, your, your sense of self-esteem. And so I, I, I have seen in the thousands of interviews that I've done over the years that the level of dysfunction in a per person's life is almost directionally, directionally, per directly proportional to how they were loved, what happened to them, and how they were able to receive or not receive that love. So it, the, 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 the what happened to you isn't you know, just for people who had the big T traumas, but it literally is what happened to you? Were you loved? Were you not? How were you loved? How was that love applied in your life? And were you able then to apply it in the rest of the world? You know, one relatives say, I, I, I'm whipping you because I love you. Well, it certainly didn't feel like love, certainly mm -hmm. didn't feel like love, but I know that for that generation, the idea of I'm going to keep you in line and I'm going to make sure you're disciplined and that you're going to yes. obey and do the right thing in their minds might have felt like love, but certainly right. did not feel like or was interpreted by me to mean love. I mean, I think now, and I know if you are culturally raised uh, the way I was, you have a lot of, of pain behind those whippings. And I remember doing a show on the Oprah show years later, talking about should children be spanked and a black woman stood up and said, well, I got beat every day and my father, I was in the choir and my father beat me in front of the, the whole congregation in church and I turned out okay. And I'm like, did you really? Because nobody, anybody who's ever been hit, realizes the humiliation of that. What you feel more than anything, even as a little kid, is the humiliation of it. And what you are being told in that moment is that you have no value, that you are worth nothing, that you are so worthless that I get now to lay my hands on you and physically beat you. So it takes a lot, and I, I would have to say that um, it, it, it was a lot for me to overcome to begin to understand that my life was of value. And as I say in What Happened to You, 
What did that for me were relationships with my teachers. I could cry right now thinking about the, the teachers who stood in the gap for me and made me feel valued, made me feel important. So it was only at school or speaking in church that I felt a sense of I mattered, that there was some meaning and, 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 and purpose for me in life. I, you know, grew up in these circumstances where I should have no self-values, no self-worth, but Bruce, as he explains in What Happened to You, you don't have to have it come from your family. Other relationships with people who mm -hmm. are nurturing, supporting, caring, and actually just see you. So the reason why I loved school so much is because that's the place that I felt seen.